Here begins the interview with the devil. I have uncovered the secret code by which I can pick up your thoughts. I have come to ask you some very plain questions. I demand that you give me direct and truthful answers. Are you ready for the interview, Mr. Devil? Yes, I am ready, but you must address me with more respect. During this interview, you will address me as your majesty. By what right do you demand such royal respect? You should know that I control 98% of the people of your world. Do you not think that entitles me to rate as royalty? Have you proof of your claim? Yes, plenty of it. Of what does your proof consist? Of many things. If you want answers, you will address me as your majesty. Some things you will understand, some you will not. In order that you may get my viewpoint, I shall describe myself and correct the false notions people have of me and my place of abode. That's a fine idea, your majesty. Start by telling me where you live, then describe your physical appearance. My physical appearance? Why, my dear Mr. Earthbound, I have no physical body. I would be handicapped by such an encumbrance as those in which you earthbound creatures live. I consist of negative energy, and I live in the minds of people who fear me. I also occupy one half of every atom of physical matter, and every unit of mental and physical energy. Perhaps you will better understand my nature if I tell you I am the negative portion of the atom. Oh, I see what you are preparing to claim. You are laying the foundation to say that if it were not for you, there would be no world, no stars, no electrons, no atoms, no human beings, nothing. Is that correct? True. Absolutely true. Well, if you only occupy one half of energy and matter, who occupies the other half? The other half is occupied by my opposition. Opposition? What do you mean? The opposition is what you earthbound call God. So, you have the universe divided up with God. Is that your claim? Not my claim, but the actual fact. Before this interview is finished, you will understand why my claim is true. You will also understand why it has to be true. Or there could be no world such as yours, no earthbound creatures such as you. I am no beast with a forked tongue and a spiked tail. But you do control the minds of 98 out of every 100 people. You said so yourself. Who causes all the misery in this 98% devil-controlled world if you do not? I have not said that I do not cause all the misery of the world. On the other hand, I boast of it. It is my business to represent the negative side of everything, including the thoughts of you earthbound people. How else could I control people? My opposition controls positive thought. I control negative thought. How do you gain control of the minds of people? Oh, that is easy. I merely move in and occupy the unused space of the human brain. I sow the seeds of negative thought in the minds of people so I can occupy and control the space. You must have many tricks and devices by which you gain and hold control of the human mind. To be sure, I employ tricks and devices to control human thought. My devices are clever ones, too. Go ahead and describe your clever tricks, Your Majesty. One of my cleverest devices for mind control is fear. I plant the seed of fear in the minds of people, and as these seeds germinate and grow through use, I control the space they occupy. The six most effective fears are the fear of poverty, criticism, ill health, loss of love, old age, and death. What of these six fears serves you most often, Your Majesty? The first and the last, poverty and death. At one time or another, during life, I will tighten my grip on all people through one or both of these. I plant these fears in the minds of people so deftly that they believe them to be their own creation. I accomplish this end by making people believe I am standing just beyond the entrance gate of the next, waiting to claim them after death for eternal punishment. Of course, I cannot punish anyone, 
except in that person's own mind, through some form of fear. But that fear of the thing which does not exist is just as useful to me as that which does exist. All forms of fear extend the space I occupy in the human mind. Your Majesty, will you explain how you gained this control over human beings? The story is too long to be told in a few words. It began o over a million years ago, when the first man began to think. Up to that time I had control over all mankind, but enemies of mine discovered the power of positive thought, placed it in the minds of men, and then began a battle on my part to remain in control. So far I have done quite well by myself, having lost only 2% of the people to the opposition. I take it from your answer that men who think are your enemies. Is that right? It is not right, but it is correct. Tell me something more about the world in which you live. I live wherever I choose. Time and space do not exist for me. I am a force best described to you as energy. My favorite physical dwelling place, as I have told you, is in the minds of the earthbound. I control a part of the brain space of every human being. The amount of space I occupy in each individual's mind depends on how little and what sort of thinking that person does. As I have told you, I cannot entirely control any person who thinks. You speak of your opposition. What do you mean by that? My opponent controls all the positive forces of the world, such as love, faith, hope, and optimism. My opponent also controls the positive forces of all natural law throughout the universe. The forces which keep the earth and the planets and all the stars balanced in their courses. But these forces are meek in comparison to the, with those which operate in the human mind under my control. You see... I do not seek to control stars and planets. I prefer the control of human minds. Where did you acquire your power, and by what means do you add to it? I add to my power by appropriating the mind power of the earthbound, as they come through the gate at the time of death. Ninety-eight out of every one hundred who come back to my plane from the earth plane are taken over by me, and their mind power is added to my being. I get all who come over with any form of fear. You see, I am constantly at work, preparing the minds of people before death, so I can appropriate them when they come back to my plane. Will you tell me how you go about your job of preparing human minds so you can control them? I have countless ways of gaining control of human minds while they are still on the earth plane. My greatest weapon is poverty. I deliberately discourage people from accumulating material wealth because poverty discourages men from thinking and makes them an easy prey for me. My be next best friend is ill health. An unhealthy body discourages thinking. Then I have countless thousands of workers on earth who aid me in gaining control of human minds. I have these agents placed in every calling. They represent every race and creed every religion. Who are your greatest enemies on earth, your majesty? All who inspire people to think and act on their own initiative are my enemies, such men as Socrates, Confucius, Voltaire, Emerson, Thomas Paine, and Abraham Lincoln, and you are not doing me any good either. Is it true that you use men who have great wealth? As I have already told you, poverty is always my friend because it discourages independence of thought and encourages fear in the minds of men. Some wealthy men serve my cause, while others do me great damage, depending on how the wealth is used. The great Rockefeller fortune, for example, is one of my worst enemies. That is interesting, Your Majesty. Will you tell me why you fear the Rockefeller fortune more than others? The Rockefeller money is being used to isolate and conquer diseases of the physical body. In all parts of the world, 
Disease has always been one of my most effective weapons. The fear of ill health is second only to the fear of poverty. The Rockefeller money is uncovering new secrets of nature in a hundred different directions, all of which are designed to help men take and keep possession of their own minds. It is encouraging new and better methods of feeding, clothing, and housing people. It is wiping out the slums in the large cities, the places where my favorite allies are found. It is financing campaigns for better government and helping to wipe out dishonesty in politics. It is helping to set higher standards in business practice and encouraging businessmen to conduct business by the golden rule. And that is not doing my cause any good. What about these boys and girls who are said to be on the road to hell? Are you in control of them? Well, I can answer that question only with a yes and no. I've corrupted the minds of the young by teaching them to drink and smoke, but they have me baffled through their tendency to think for themselves. You say you have corrupted the minds of young people with liquor and cigarettes. I can understand how liquor might destroy the power of independent thought, but do not see what cigarettes have to do with helping your cause. You may not know it, but cigarettes break down the power of persistence. They destroy the power of endurance. They destroy the ability to concentrate, and they deaden and undermine the imaginative faculty. And they help in other ways to keep people from using their minds most effectively. Do you know I have millions of people, young and old, of both sexes who smoke two packages of cigarettes a day? That means I have millions of people who are gradually destroying their power of resistance. One day I shall add to their habit of cigarette smoking other thought-destroying habits until I have gained control of their minds. Habits come in pairs, triplets and quadruplets. Any habit which weakens one's willpower invites a flock of its relatives to move in and take possession of the mind. The cigarette habit not only lowers the power of resistance and discourages persistence, but it invites looseness in other human relationships. I never thought that cigarettes were a tool of destruction, Your Majesty. But your explanation throws a different light on the subject. How many converts to the habit do you now claim? I am proud of my record. Millions are now victims, and the number is increasing daily. Soon I shall have most of the world indulging in the habit. In thousands of families, I now have followers of the habit, including every member of the family. Very young boys and girls are beginning to take up the habit. They are learning how to smoke by observing their parents and older brothers and sisters. Which do you consider to be your greater tool for gaining control of human minds? Cigarettes or liquor? Without hesitation, I would say cigarettes. Once I get a young person to join my two packages a day club, I have no trouble in inducing that person to take on the habit of liquor, overindulgence in sex, and all other related habits which destroy independence of thought and action. Your Majesty, when I began this interview, I had you all wrong. I thought you were a fraud and a fake, but I see now that you are quite real and very powerful. Your apology is accepted, but you need not have bothered. Millions of people have questioned my power, and I got most of them at the gate as they came over. I ask no person to believe in me. I prefer that people fear me. I am no beggar. I take what I want by cleverness and force, begging people to believe is the business of my opposition, not mine. Your Majesty, please pardon my rudeness, but I would not be able to look myself in the face again if I did not tell you here and now that you are the damnedest fiend ever to be turned loose on innocent people. I always had the wrong conception of you. I thought you were kind enough to let people alone while they were living, that you merely tortured their souls after death. Now I learn from your own brazen confession that you destroy their right to freedom, 
of thought and cause them to go through a living hell on earth. What do you have to say about that? I get what I want by exercising self-control. It is not so good for my own business, but I suggest you emulate me instead of criticizing me. You call yourself a thinker, and you are. Otherwise, you would never have forced this interview on me. But you will never be the sort of thinker that frightens me, unless you gain and exercise control over your emotions. <sighs> Let us get away from personalities. I came here to learn more about you, not to discuss myself. Please go ahead and tell me of the many tricks you have devised for gaining control of the human mind. What is your most powerful weapon just now? That is a difficult question to answer. I have so many devices for entering the human minds and controlling them that it is difficult to say which are the most powerful. Right at the moment, I am trying to bring about another world war. My friends here in Washington are helping me to involve America in the war. If I can start the world to killing on a wholesale basis, I shall be able to put into operation my favorite device for mind control. It is what you may call mass fear. I used this device to bring about the other world war in 1914. I used it to bring about the economic depression in 1929. And if my opposition had not double-crossed me, I would now be in possession of every man, woman, and child in the world. You can see for yourself how near I came to world domination, the thing I have been struggling to attain for thousands of years. Yes, I see your point. Who wouldn't? You are a very ingenious manipulator of the minds of people. Is your devilish business carried on only through people of high position and great influence? Oh no. I use the minds of people all in all walks of life. As a matter of fact, I prefer the type of person who makes no pretense of thinking. I can manipulate that sort of person without difficulty. I could not control 98% of, of the world if all people were skilled in thinking for themselves. I am interest in, interested in the welfare of those people whom you claim to control. Therefore, I wish you to tell me all of the tricks by which you enter and control their minds. I want a complete confession from you. So begin with your cleverest trick. This is suicide you are forcing on me, but I'm helpless. So settle down and I will place in your hands the weapon by which millions of your fellow earthbound will defend themselves against me. <laughs> 